take some time today and give you some background on um, what to do to approach Silicon Valley the most effectively. An international market, specifically Silicon Valley, the first thing you, you want to be aware of is what are the problems and pitfalls that people run into, what are the things they do wrong. When you're doing your pitches, you want to, you want to explain also what the, what's, what's the pain that you're addressing. American buyers assume that you have good quality, exceptional value, and that you're going to sell it at a fair price. Also, you have to be aware that of American enthusiasm. They can sound like they think it's great, you've got a great product, etc., but um, don't mistake the enthusiasm for a willingness to purchase. So um, a lot of Europeans are much more understated, Americans are more overstated, right? And so you have to sort of know how to calibrate um, what, what they're actually saying and learn what the, what the nuances are of, what, of their enthusiasm, what it means underneath. Um, you have to tell an American buyer why you're better. Here, if you don't say you're the best, no one's going to, you know, pay attention to you. But you have to back it up with, you know, <laughs> the, you know, that your customer base, the sales that you have. Why, you know, what's the pain you're addressing? You know, what's the solution you're providing to what pain? And then you have to tell them. There's three things you have to focus on when you're talking to investors here, angels or VC investors. And um, the first thing is, uh, what, what's your, not the first thing, but one of the main things is who your team is what the pain is that you're addressing and um, what, the pro what the product is, like what's, what's sort of the, the benefit of the product, the value of the product, the value proposition. There's no one key to success. I think you have, there's about 20 keys to success. <laughs> and um, you have to um, master um, some of the 20 keys or most of them in order to really be successful. There's a, it takes a lot of um, planning, preparation, targeting your market, um, connecting with people, understanding um, how to approach the American market, um, articulating it correctly, uh, finding the right coaches, finding the right mentors, uh, knowing how to connect with the angel investors if you need them, etc. There's there's many, many things that you need to do. So there isn't any just one key. You, you know, there's a lot of people in the world who have a really good service and a really good product that's really unique, but they don't know how to um, articulate it clearly. And that's something that, and then, they, then who they're selling it to, it has to be really, really clear. And it sounds really basic and obvious, but it's a big problem because people, a lot of companies come here and they're not clear. Et on sait qu'une entreprise à potentiel qui veut grandir, un, elle doit investir, deux, elle doit innover, trois, elle doit s'internationaliser. On a un cluster software editing avec quelques très belles boîtes en IT, et donc quand on pose la question à ces entreprises, un certain nombre d'entre elles disent « Ok, ce qui nous intéresse, c'est les États-Unis ». Alors les États-Unis, bien évidemment, c'est Silicon Valley, c'est euh, cette vallée dans laquelle se trouve une concentration d'énormes boîtes IT et de toute une série de petites entreprises innovantes, mais aussi d'investisseurs, mais aussi de clients intéressants pour ces petites boîtes. Et donc le but, c'était de pouvoir venir ici. Alors on a essayé de préparer nos entreprises, notamment à pitcher, hein, le fameux elevator pitch, 55 secondes. Dans ce cas-ci, c'est 4 minutes. Et donc nos entreprises ont été entraînées à pitcher. On leur a donné des slides, on leur a expliqué comment il fallait faire. Certains l'ont répété à la BE avec nous. On a encore une séance de répétition cet après-midi. Et le but, c'est de les amener demain face euh, comment dirais-je, à des investisseurs, face à des business angels, de manière à ce qu'ils puissent tenter de les intéresser par rapport à leurs propositions de valeur, par rapport euh, aux clients qu'ils recherchent ici, par rapport à leur développement potentiel aux états unis Welcome and thank you for um, inviting us here today. Uh, my name is Alfredo Coppola from U.S. Market Access Center. I work very closely with Michael. So I'm going to call you Chris Burry at the back. So I hope you had a great morning and a great day yesterday. And today we're very excited to have representatives from the angel investment community. I have on my right uh, Max Shapiro, who's uh, an investor in uh, Koretsu Forum and is also has his own recruiting company called People Connect Staffing. So I'll let Max introduce the uh, angel panel that we have today. My name is Max Shapiro. I'm a member of the Koretsu Forum, uh, as well as a member of Golden Seeds, another angel organization, and a third angel organization called Silicon Ventures, S-I-L-I-C-O-M. And I had the pleasure of putting this panel together, all of whom uh, are friends and people that I've been on other panels with, and I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves. So, uh, Tom, if you would like to uh, introduce yourself first, please. And just yes. Go around. 
Thanks, Max. I'm uh, Tom Cervantes. So I'm the uh, founder and co-chair of the Harvard Angels, which is the angel group for Harvard Business School here in the Bay Area. Like others, as part of uh, angel investing, you, you must have money to invest. And part of that is uh, I have my own law firm, small firm, business counsel law group, and I also advise and work with venture capitalists and angel investors and others as they are launching companies, investing companies here in Silicon Valley. Uh, my name is uh, David Dembitz. I'm with the uh, Critzer Forum. Uh, I'm a member of uh, the Critzer Forum Silicon Valley chapter. John. Good morning. My name is John Ryan, and uh, I'm here on behalf of uh, the Band of Angels, which is a Silicon Valley-based organization of about 125 members. I'm a professional angel. So I really like the angel process, I like learning about new businesses, but it's also what I view my job to be. So I try to associate myself with people who know more than I do, and I'm very comfortable with that conclusion in the case of the Band of Angels. These people are really very talented. My name is Sajad Masood, and I'm uh, representing Harvard Angels today. Um, I'm one of the co-chairs, uh, and uh, we are a relatively new, newer um, angel group uh, that's been um, very active recently and uh, we were formed out of our local Harvard Business School Alumni Association so it uh, uh, within the community we have a lot of Harvard alums who um, collaborate on um, identifying eventually investing in those. A few words from Serge to talk about your mission here today and a profile of the companies. That'd be great. My name is Serge, I'm working for the Brussels Enterprise Agency uh, we are an organization supported by the government and our job is to help the companies to develop their business in Brussels and of course abroad. Uh, so companies come to us when they need advice uh, on how to get funding, how to go to market, how to make a good business plan. So we, we work a lot with VCs, with banks, with other financial institutions. And uh, we, are here, we, have, uh, we have designed this mission especially for software companies since we have a very strong cluster of uh, companies based in Brussels. So I'm very proud today to uh, offer you, or at least to introduce you to uh, some of the top uh, software companies of Brussels. Uh, I hope you will enjoy and uh, uh, now I let, I let the floor to, to the guys now. Thank you very much. It's going to be four minutes of presentation, then we're going to do two minutes of questions and two minutes of feedback. Who, who's timing? Yeah, Chris. Chris. Okay. And uh, Michael. Uh, Michael. Uh, yeah. For two minutes and then the four minutes for the second part. Okay. Right. So it's going to be four, two, and two. Correct. And just let us know when we're done with the two minutes of questions. So I'll say time. Perfect. Thank you. But I guess you're going to be. I think if you come here, come, come, come yeah. here. <laughs> and here would be good. Um, okay. So the question is, how many CV, how many resume, human resource professionals are reading on an annual basis? The answer is huge of the amount uh, of, of resume. But how can they be sure about the reliability of those resume? Reliability in terms of the dates, job description, um, <coughs> diploma, and grades. It's very difficult. So this is the question that's um, many studies have shown uh, in, in the last months and the answer is between 20 and 50 percent of resume are not enough reliable. That's the figures we receive. Just imagine that, uh, I hope this really doesn't happen, that you get diagnosed with cancer and uh, this is a genomic disease, you can get the DNA sequence, you can get it in a hard disk, bring it to your doctor and uh, this might have the answers to the disease but the doctor won't have a clue of what to do with it. Okay. In your presentation, you need to identify what the problem is, what you did, and the need. Uh, you need to identify the solution and the IP that you have that's protected. You need to talk about the management team that you've done this, you have experience in, and your track record. You need to identify the target market that you're going after and how you're going to go after it as far as your sales distribution channel. Uh, you need to talk about the competition, what's out there, and then you need to talk about uh, the traction that you currently have, uh, you need to talk about funding, what your present funding situation is and what you're looking for funds, and you need to talk about what the use of funds is going to be, and finally, most importantly, what is the exit strategy, because we're not looking at this as a hobby, we're looking at this as an investment, so we want to know how much money you need and when are we going to get back our money and how much money are we going to get back. Okay, great job. Thank you.
to be. If I could just take a minute and okay. just give you my general comments briefly and then ask each of the panelists, and, and I've got to say I'm really impressed with the presentations. Not just the presentations, but some, some great business ideas, and you know, it's, it's been a pleasure to, to listen to these and, and learn about, about what, you, what you guys are doing. Very, very impressive. And of course, this is our group, and Hi. so welcome, everybody's welcome. here, healthy, happy, and looking alive. Yeah, sorry we couldn't have better, better weather for you, but uh, apparently they do at home. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're going to go up to the fourth floor. The way they're trying to offsell it is actually use NetSuite. They have a big BPO practice, big transactional outsourcing practice, and so they use NetSuite as a method of outsourcing their transactions that winning the BPO business. And that's the only way they make up their money because you know they're losing a lot of money on the services. But that also gives you an indication about how much easier it is to employ, deploy, and implement an on-premise solution. give a little background about myself so folks know. Um, we covered three basic topics, right? Um, I want to talk about sort of innovation and what that means to us at Google. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the tools that we have within Google that make that innovation possible. And then I'll just touch a little bit upon the culture, you know, just, you know, part of our management philosophy, our engineering philosophy, and, and what sort of drives the company. The second part is, is bottom-up decision making, right? So. Uh, we take what is what is traditionally your your pyramid for you know the managers at the top, the VPs at the top, and the directors and managers and the engineers, and we flip that upside down, right? Decisions here are bottom up, and by that I mean um, mm -hmm. let's take a feature that needs. So there's a feature on Gmail. Let's say users are complaining about something on on the home page, on on the Gmail pa page, and they want to change the orientation of the compose button. As an example, just some random example, right? This feedback is available because we have channels where we can get user feedback. <laughs> The decision on to what that color of the button should be and what the size should be doesn't come from the top. It actually comes from the engineers working on that. So they get together as a group and say, they say, you know what? It's if we actually made that button, you know, shifted a little bit to the right and we added a new piece of JavaScript to make it load three times faster, it would improve the customer experience. We should go ahead and do that. They get together as a group. They form a design uh, doc. They get it reviewed. They write the code. They prototype it. Then they go tell their manager, you know what? This is what we want to do. Make it happen, like you know, help us or support us. And the same thing, the managers will let them go to their VPs or their directors and make it happen. The the power of this is now you have you basically have sharded, you've distributed the intelligent decision making process through all your organization and not through just a few people. As a manager, that gives me a lot of flexibility, gives me a lot of power, right? Because now I know that engineers on my team are not going to be blocked waiting for me to tell them something if something goes wrong. They have the power, they have the tools, they have the authority to go make the changes, and then they let me know. Any engineer in any part of the company can go and challenge any norm that we have. So someone says, you know what, I don't like our code review process, we need to change it, right? We need to, you know, we need to introduce a new language into the system because uh, I'm sick and tired of like coding in Java or something. Um, yeah, go ahead and do it. If you find a group of engineers who's excited about it, go ahead and make it happen. There's almost no one to stop you. But, but really the key thing is you own the decision. So that's, that's the other power of bottom-up decision making. Because now the decision is made by the engineers, they own it as well. So if it doesn't go right and if it doesn't if it does if it goes wrong, 
they can't really blame anyone. It's basically themselves who are to, to own, which is really, again, very, very powerful.